Grüß Sie from Vienna, Austria. Welcome to Opus 10 of Classical Cake, the podcast where we discuss topics relating to Viennese classical music and Austrian culture while enjoying one of Vienna's delicious cakes. I'm your host, Daniel Adam Maltz. We are at the Kunsthistorisches Museum's collection of historic musical instruments, one of the most important instrument displays in the world. In addition to a large number of Renaissance and Baroque instruments, they also house a collection of Viennese forte pianos. In the 18th and 19th centuries, there was a rich tradition of piano building in Vienna. These Viennese forte pianos had different characteristics from the pianos built in other European regions and were wildly different from the modern piano that we know today. My guest today, Dr. Alphonse Huber, is leader of the restoration workshop at the collection. He has also published numerous articles on restoration and historical keyboard instruments. He is one of the foremost experts on Viennese keyboard instrument restoration. Dr. Huber, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. Our cake today is a nuskus. This treat has multiple layers of hazelnut crisp with hazelnut cream frosting snaking on top. The cake is bordered by delicate bars of milk chocolate. Let's dig in. Mmm. Lecker, lecker. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> and this is paper. The chocolate. Wall, the wall is also chocolate. Oh, yes. Mm. <laughs> it's very delicious. So, how did you get into instrument restoration? By accident. First, I wanted to become an organ maker. And to understand what the organist wanted to play, I started with the study of church music. I played the organ for 10 years. But in between, I know that I am legasthenic. And I had always big problems with reading and with crossing arms, so it didn't work. And after two years, my professor said, I must decide either to practice eight hours a day or to change my goal, yeah? And I changed my goal. And at the same moment, I got knowledge of this new study in Vienna. A new course was founded at the Academy of Fine Arts course in restoration of music instruments. Peter Kuckelke, he was my teacher. He was a very fascinating, a little bit ambivalent personality, but I'm very thankful to him. Among others, the thinking in old measures, it's a very important detail. It's one of the fruits of the contact with him. The study took five years. Then I was two years a freelancer and in April 1983, I started here in the museum. And were you always restoring keyboard instruments or all sorts of instruments? <laughs> I am the jack of all trades and master <laughs> of none. For many, many years, it was for me the source of bad feeling. I always could define very well what I am not. I am not a trained harpsichord maker, I'm not a piano maker, I'm not a lute maker, I'm not a violin maker. I was nothing, but I was responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. And on the one side it was frustrating, and on the other side I was forced to be always very slow and very careful. Because my basic feeling was, I have no sense. And this bewared me from very big mistakes and the problem with modern teaching is that you project your present your actual knowledge to the former times and one of my philosophies was if you want to understand a certain period you must begin to study two or better three generations before and you must forget everything which came afterwards and I have observed that only few persons uh, follow this rule. I also think of the extreme importance of understanding the era around just, it can't just be I love Beethoven, it has to be yeah. what era shaped Beethoven, but I, in the type of thought around in the time and everything that is shaped around it is crucially important to understanding. I think that every student who is studying the classical era, he must play one year the clavichord hmm. because without the clavichord you never will understand mozart especially haydn haydn for example i played haydn as a student and I, on the modern piano and i don't like it for me it was very boring 
In the meantime, I have built around 20 clavichords from 1400 to 1800. And when I started to play Haydn on the clavichord, I immediately understood. Also, one single tone on the clavichord is different than a single tone on the, for the piano. And you can, on a good clavichord, you can influence the tone after the touch. Mm -hmm. And for example, the suspensions in Haydn's menuets or in the slower movements, you can't describe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everything was conceived on the clavichord. Yeah, Haydn. and I have read it in his biography that also as an old man, he started early in the morning and he improvised every day three to four hours before lunch. And when he had a good idea, he wrote it down mm. and he was inspired by the clavichord. So also some orchestral music smells for me sometimes, oh, it's a typical clavichord mm. <laughs> passage. Yeah. yeah. There were two main types of forte pianos, Viennese and English. Today, we're going to focus on Viennese forte pianos, but to clarify for the audience, what are the main differences between the two? To be correct, this differentiation between English and Viennese forte piano didn't exist at the beginning. Piano making started all over Europe, mainly with a Stoßmechanik, what we call today the English action. So there are three important instruments by Anton Walter, and the best known is Mozart's own Hammerflügel, which is preserved in Salzburg. And all three earliest preserved Walter instruments have changed actions. And obviously the hammer rail is cut out, and he changed it from Stoßzungenmechanik to what we call today Viennese action. The reason is that the, the Viennese action or German action, the Stein's invention, that the action is very, very vivid and accurate and uh, it follows much more the intentions of the fingers. Loudness is not the goal, it's not the problem, it's not a theme. Loudness is not a form of quality. If we speak louder, what is better? I can speak interestingly or poetic, or a lyric. Uh, you can speak. communicate anything but genau. without volume. Genau. Yeah. yeah. And as music took place mainly in smaller rooms for private interest, just for fun, you need not loudness because in a small room we don't shout if we speak with each other. Unless you're American. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <yes. laughs> so. What is the answer to your question? Uh, <laughs> if I make a resume, the Viennese piano makers, they were organ makers. The title of the profession was organ and instrument maker. And instrument was the keyboard, the string keyboard. So they built organs and clavichords and harpsichords and for the pianos. And they started with Dostungen mechanic, the English action. After 1782 or 3, the knowledge of the new action came down the Danube from Augsburg. Johann Andreas Stein was very famous before and he became much more famous with the new action until he died in 1792. And the Viennese adopted the new action and kept the old one. Schanz, for example, and Anton Walter in the square pianos, they kept the Stoßzugemechanik and with the Flügel, they preferred the better Viennese section. Hmm. The modern piano evolved from the English lineage of piano making. So why did the Viennese section all but disappear? After 1830, loudness became the goal. Hmm. And you can reach loudness only by more mass of the hammers and mass of the strings, thicker strings, more tension and heavier hammers. And that's the point where the Viennese action can't follow. So it was, as halls got bigger and bigger and tastes changed, these English pianos needed to fill the space. The main reason was the loudness. Yeah. yeah. So your collection here at the museum has Viennese pianos from roughly the 1780s all the way up to 1958. Can you walk us through how these instruments changed over time? The story which you can read in many books first was the clavichord it was very soft and very primitive then and then comes the harpsichord it was a bit, little bit louder uh, and then thanks god uh, you know we, we got the pianoforte and now we have the steinway and <laughs> it is the loudest and the best yeah mm. this uh, story is wrong and stupid uh, in, in the 1770s 
all instruments uh, lived uh, peacefully together. I would say that during Mozart's lifetime, the main focus was to keep the lightness of the key touch of the harpsichord and combined with a hammer action which reacts like in the clavichord. The pianist expected the lightness of the action. The Fitzwilliam virginal book, yeah, you see the lady. The music is running from heaven through the arms into the keyboard, yeah, without any force. That's the goal. No force. Simply movement and playing by itself. And for almost 20 years, they were happy with their five octave instrument. And around 1800, they invented mangan as a content in the metal alloy. And that was the point where you can reach C4. Then the six octave instrument came on stage. And in the bass, they could have reached contra C, but the music that doesn't make sense with contra C sure. in this time. So we are now around 1800. And here again, the fascinating thing was colors. and. In this time, so it started probably in the late 1790s, to have more pedals. And the most fascinating thing was the Janissary stuff. Mm -hmm. So we have a piano by Franz Dorn, not dated, around 1815. It has uh, seven pedals. <laughs> and you have the Fagot, and the piano, and the pianissimo, and shift uh, pedal, and uh, the tempo pedal, and a harp, and double moderator and the bells and the drum. Mm -hmm. It was also to play arrangement of operas or it was the time of Napoleon and to have description of battle. Wellington Sieg mm -hmm. uh, by Beethoven transcribed for pianoforte and, and you can make all this noise <laughs> as a, uh, which makes the pianos untuned. <laughs> the drum makes the, it immediately untuned. <laughs> In around 1820 is the next step. Music was played in bigger halls for more people. And this was the start of more loudness, of more solo concerts, of virtuosos running around in Europe and playing in Paris and St. Petersburg and in Berlin and Vienna, and impresarios mm -hmm. who wanted to make money. Yeah? And if you have place for more people, you can get more money. And this is a process, yeah? it is not a decision by one person, but it is a progressive process, which the end of this process is Carnegie Hall, or mm -hmm. Große Musikvereinsaal, with 2,500 persons hearing one person playing piano. Yeah. You restored a Schanz piano from 1795. Ludwig van Beethoven wrote in a letter that a Schanz would be the ideal instrument on which to play his famous Moonlight Sonata. What do you think of the unique characteristics of the Schanz that made him feel this way? It was a time of experiments and the masters at this time struggled for the best sound. What is the best sound? Yeah, For this speaking and articulating poetic sound. Very close. The, the, the piano was compared with the sound of the human voice and with the sound of woodwind instruments. The goal of the piano makers was to make a speaking, singing piano. And our Schanz piano has a peculiarity which is really unique. It is not unique by Schanz, the other masters too, but it has no gap spacer. And when we restrung, this instrument was restored in the past several times. And when we restrung the instrument, this experience, I can, I can still have it in mind. This instrument, it sounds different. Why? And then I imaginated that it has no gap spacer. And the gap spacer is iron bar between the reverse of the rest plank and the belly rail. It keeps in distance the base for the action. Mm -hmm. But every part who touches the soundboard sucks energy from the soundboard. And that's exactly what happens with the gap spacer. The gap spacer sucks energy of this area of the soundboard. And most instruments, also Walter's instrument, have a weak area at the right side of the gap spacer, uh, between, let's say, F1 to F2, so around C2, 
the quality of the sound has a little damage. Yeah? And it's my theory, I can't prove it. The Schanz piano in the middle is entirely free. Hmm. When doing a restoration, do you use new parts or do you source original parts from the appropriate era? This question is my favorite. It touches my favorite field. Many of our visitors expect original sound. It is not the purpose of a museum to keep or to care of original sound. Original sound doesn't exist. It's an illusion. Or if original sound ever exists, then if a modern maker has understood the idea of the old maker and repeats in all details, which is impossible, what has been done 200 years before, then this instrument produces original sound. The purpose of a museum is to keep and to demonstrate authentic information and sound coming from an old instrument is the result of an instrument where in all details we have understood inherent necessities or the practical constraints. During a restoration the main goal is to keep all original parts and if we change parts, ribs, soundboards, strings, leathers, what you hear afterwards is fantasy and many, many recordings and concerts with original sound is simply illusion. Mm. And the best example we have here in the collection, it is a famous instrument, Clara de Robert Schumann get it for their wedding uh, by Konrad Graf, it is a Konrad Graf in the possession of the Gesellschaft of the Musikfreunde. When Robert Schumann died in July 1856, Clara decided renovation, yeah? and what have they done? They put away the original leathers and put felt instead of leather. And the treble, which was too soft and too weak, they put thicker strings, mm -hmm. exactly the wrong way. No, but to become more modern, they used thicker strings. And in this state, the instrument, it is a state from September 1856. Mm. So it has nothing to do with Schumann. But Brahms became it afterwards. Oh, it's the Brahms piano now. But Brahms wrote a letter to Gerda Schumann. What should we do with Robert's piano? It is really very old, 30 years old, uh, and it is not more than a good memory. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's also for Brahms, he was not the beloved, inspiring instrument. It was a worn out old piano. And many recordings, and oh, oh Schumann, has he heard it, yeah? To be honest, I am fascinated by the old instruments. They tell us something. But to be honest too, people expect original sound. Mm -mm. We are an hospice for old pianos. We have uh, Marie Callas and if she sings at her 80th anniversary, it is not the Callas with 40. Mm -hmm. but there is a sort of wisdom and experience also in the old voice and old instruments sometimes have it too. Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven and Schubert compose their music to be played on Viennese forte pianos. Visit Vienna's collection of historical instruments to get fresh insights into their music. While you're there, you can also enjoy their extensive collection of string and wind instruments. Thanks to you listeners for tuning in. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Classical Cake. Visit classicalcake.com for more episodes and exclusive content relating to Viennese classical music and Austrian culture. Thanks, Dr. Huber, for sharing this classical cake with me. You're welcome. I'm Daniel Adam Maltz. See you in Vienna. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>